Good evening. I was, I grew up in a small town just north of Keene called Gilson, New Hampshire. I moved there when I was not quite one year old with my parents. And a year later, my brother was born, and two years after that, my twin sisters were born, and a few years after that, my youngest sister was born. It was a big old, long, ramshackle New England farmhouse on an abandoned farm with attached sheds and barns. It was a great place to grow up. It wasn't until I got to first grade that I came to realize that there was something different about my family. You see, my mother had immigrated to the United States from Switzerland when she was in her mid-twenties. And unknown to me, she had a heavy Swiss-German accent. <laughs> I never noticed it. She was my mom. I understood her perfectly when I chose to. <laughs> and yet my schoolmates, they were on to her. <laughs> What I loved about my mom was that she was determined, despite the fact that we lived thousands of miles away from her family, to infuse our family with the traditions of birthdays and holidays that she had grown up with as a young girl back in Switzerland. At the apex of that holiday tradition was Christmas. And central to that holiday tradition was the Christmas tree and this mysterious being, mythical being, called the Christmas angel. Our Christmas tree had to be cut not a day before the 23rd of December. And the reason was because we didn't want to burn the house down with the live candles that we put on the tree. <laughs> It was always a source of some discussion between my parents, because what you have to know about the Swiss, if you have never been there, is they're very orderly, everything is tidy and neat, and it's always perfect, and everything is organized and runs on time. My father was a forester and often in the woods, so you would think he would be a good source of trees. <laughs> <laughs> Christmas trees, particularly. But my, on the 23rd of Christmas, when I was about 10 years old, I was in school with my brother and two of my sisters. And it was the last day before the Christmas holidays. And apparently, Dad brought a tree home before lunch. It didn't even come close. <laughs> so, right after lunch, that my mother bundled up my youngest sister, who was about four at the time. And we had had early snow that winter, and she took her by the hand, and they walked up into our woodlot, way up onto the ridge, where there was a growth of spruce trees. There happened to be a logging job going on in the woodlot, which was important, because my mother fixed her eye on a 70-foot red spruce <laughs> that had a perfect tree at the top eight feet. <laughs> so she went down, purloined some poor logger who was trying to make a living, got him to come up the tree hill with his chainsaw, which he cut the tree down, lopped off the eight feet, and she dragged it back to the house with my eight, uh, young sister through the deep snow, about a mile. <laughs> And before we got home from school, at the start of Christmas vacation that afternoon, she put it in the tree in the corner. And when we got home, it was in the tree in the corner of the living room. And it was a very spectacular tree because it had, among other things, about walnut-sized pine cones, which we've never seen before on, the, on our Christmas tree. So, my... My mom wanted to make sure that the tree was put together right. So we all were going off to bed, and the, the rule was nobody 
nobody got near the Christmas tree to decorate it except the Christmas angel. And that would happen while we were in bed. <laughs> so sure enough, the next morning we came down, the tree was all decorated, little wax candles, about 50 of them all over the tree. But we had lots to do. We had to get our uncle who flew up from New York, my mother's Swiss uncle, with packages full of treats and special food that you could only get in New York. We came home, packages were last minute wrapping, and then all the children put their little cardboard boxes full of their packages in front of the Christmas tree, and the door was closed to the living room. We had a, about 5.30, we'd have a traditional dinner of special soup, Swiss cheese, and bread, and if we were lucky, a little sip of wine to toast our relatives across the sea. And then my mother, while Dad and Uncle Bill did the dishes, would take the five children upstairs into the hall, close the door, and she would tell us stories about what it was like to grow up in Switzerland at Christmas time during the Second World War. I kind of paid attention to these stories, but I was particularly fixated on the window because I knew the Christmas angel was around because there was a tree getting prepared downstairs. So I kept looking, it was dark as hell, I didn't see anything. A little bell would ring and we would come downstairs, the door would open, and the only light in the living room were the lights of the Christmas tree. And it was ma magnificent. The lights, the candle, nice glow, we could smell balsam. There were uh, brass stars and hearts my mother had brought from Switzerland. There were other little ornaments that had come from her mother in Germany, made in Germany, and her friend from Norway, the reindeer. And at the very top of the tree was a little Swiss flag and a little American flag where you would normally have the angel of the star. And that, those flags had been on my parents' wedding cake. We would sit, listen to the music, always playing on the Victrola in the corner. We often had Joan Sutherland singing Silent Night. When the music stopped, everyone would sit and look at the tree and talk a little bit about family, far and wide. <clears throat> and then I would read the Christmas story. And then we would just sit and look at the trees some more. What I particularly remember that one night that I was sitting there by that beautiful tree was I finished reading and I, for a moment, a shadow went by the window and I looked to the left and I saw the Christmas angel leave. Thank you.